Sometimes I feel like we're the blind following the blind, especially when it comes to eating every two hours. How many times have you heard that? That in order to boost your metabolism, you need to eat every two hours. I don't know who ever came up with that, but in theory it makes sense, but it clearly wasn't all that backed up. I'm gonna break down why eating every two hours essentially is a myth. And a big shout out to sixpackabs.com because I did this video for them in a different format. The content was so good, I wanted to share it with you guys too. And by the way, make sure you hit that subscribe button because I'm releasing three to four videos a week. I wanna make sure that you're a part of it. All right, let's get down into the science. So when it comes down to eating every two hours, it makes sense at first. Every time we eat, we boost our metabolism a little bit. So consequently, if we eat every couple of hours, we'd be increasing our metabolism constantly throughout the day, right? Wrong. Part of it is true. We do boost our metabolism a tiny bit when we eat, but there are bigger, bigger factors at play. I'm talking about massive hormones that dictate the way our bodies work. I'm talking about insulin and another one called glucagon. And I have to explain how they work, and then I'm gonna back it up with research like I always do. Please make sure you stay through the end of this video because I am gonna drop some knowledge on you that's gonna allow everything to make sense. So first of all, let's talk about insulin. Insulin is a hormone that is released whenever we eat. Whether we eat proteins, fats, or carbohydrates. Obviously, carbohydrates being the most powerful one. So our pancreas produces insulin in response to these foods, and it breaks them down. It breaks carbohydrates down into further glucose that the cell can absorb, it breaks fats down into fatty acids so that our cells can absorb those, and it can help break protein down into amino acids and store those. It's always involved in the storing process. Now, the way that it works with proteins, fats, and carbs is all different, but at the end of the day, it's still the same general premise. It allows our body to absorb those nutrients. Now, once insulin has done its job, meaning it's allowed our cells to open up and absorb the nutrients, then and only then does it start to come back down to its baseline level. So imagine insulin slightly increasing and spiking up every time you consume something, telling your cells it's okay to absorb what you're eating. All right, so once that's done, then things change. Your body is flat out in absorptive phase, period. Now the way that insulin works with fat is pretty unique, and this is one that people don't talk about a lot. You see, insulin does react with fat. The way that it reacts with fat is it takes those fatty acids and it allows a fat cell to store them in an area called the vacuole, which is sort of an expandable, almost stomach-like area of a fat cell. So therefore, it allows that fat cell to get bigger. So insulin does allow fatty acids to get into a fat cell to make it bigger. So again, case in point, insulin is gaining. Now there's another hormone that's at play, and that one's called glucagon. I'm gonna drop some quick research on you really quick because I want this to make sense before I totally describe glucagon, all right? So there was a study that was published in the Journal of Comparative and Physiological Psychology that looked at the difference between insulin and glucagon. They took two groups of rats. One group of rats, they gave an injection of insulin. The other group of rats, they gave an injection of glucagon. They ate the exact same thing at the same intervals and performed the same kinds of exercise. The rats that were injected with glucagon lost significantly more fat than those that were given insulin. The ones that were given insulin actually gained weight. Case in point, pretty cut and dry. All right, so what do I mean by this? Well, you see, glucagon is the opposite of insulin. Glucagon essentially allows the nutrients that have been stored by insulin to release out of the cell into the bloodstream to be used for energy. Let me put it like this, as simple as I possibly can. If insulin is to storage, then glucagon is to release, period. So if we're constantly in absorptive phase, how are we ever able to trigger the release of glucagon to therefore release the fats that need to be burned? So carbohydrates that are sitting in your muscle cells, sitting in your liver cells, they're in the way of glycogen. Well, they need to be released and they get converted back into glucose by glucagon. Fatty acids that are stored in a fat cell, they need glucagon to turn them into mobilized fatty acids through the process of lipolysis or burning fat. So it all makes sense now, right? Every time we eat, we spike insulin. We have to wait four hours for that insulin to really come back down. Only when it's down low and only then is glucagon going to be released again. Now glucagon is the hormone that's gonna let you burn fat. So do the math. If you're eating every two hours, you're barely having these dips in insulin. You're not having enough of a dip to really release glucagon and allow you to burn fat. You can still burn fat, but you'd have to be very, very low calorie. 
So let's look at a study about meal intervals now. So boom, another research bomb for you. Let's look at how this works. This particular study was a randomized crossover study, which is an even more in-depth study. It took 54 diabetic patients. The reason they're using diabetic patients is because it's more important when we're looking at carbohydrates, glucose monitoring, and all that. Okay, they split these groups into two groups. One group consumed two larger meals per day, breakfast and lunch. The other group consumed six smaller meals throughout the day, but both totaling the same amount of calories. Well, they were measuring a few different things, but what the study concluded was that the group that had larger meals, but only a couple per day, had significantly lower levels of insulin, significantly lower levels of blood glucose, increased levels of ghrelin, which is the hunger hormone, but also increased resting metabolic rate. Yep, metabolism actually increased by having larger meals split a little bit wider apart than eating consistently throughout the day. If that doesn't really make my point, then I don't know what will. I'm not saying you can't burn fat by eating small meals throughout the day, but we have to listen to these big factors at play, like insulin and glucagon, big deciding factors that dictate how our body utilizes energy. So I'm not saying go out and fast day in and day out. I'm not condoning one particular diet over the other. I guess the purpose of this video is to make sure that you're doing your solid research before you just buy into whatever the fitness community tells you to do. So the fitness community isn't always the healthiest community. They may look like it, but deep down, <laughs> their bodies are struggling just like a lot of very unhealthy people. So as always, make sure you keep it locked in. Let me know what videos you wanna see. And if you haven't already, make sure you hit that little bell so that you turn on notifications. You can see whenever I go live, but also whenever I post a new video. I will see you very soon.